everybody. It's a Wednesday. That means only one thing. It's time now for Supernatural News. And we need your parish shares. We'll talk about that later, you and I, together. We'll have a little sit down, a little talk. Uh, we have a great show today, folks. We got lots of stories. We're going to jump right into it today. But to do so, we need a co-hostess. So we bring her in now. She's witty. She's intelligent. She's written many, many more books than I or you ever have. Let's bring her in now. Jessica Freeberg. Hi, Jess. Hello. I make the intro short today because we have a lot to get to today, Jess. Uh, lots of good stories, lots of good stuff. I teased yesterday I had some good news amongst Mercury Retrograde trying to kick my ass this week. Yeah. I've had so much stuff go on this week. Okay, so here's all the bad. I'm just going to go through the bad real quick, right? Um, my mom developed COVID this week, of all things. Oh. Yeah. So, um, and then I have to argue with her doctors, doctors, plural, because for some reason they don't think that a uh, asthmatic diabetic with heart failure and a pacemaker uh, should should probably get some sort of medication for COVID, that they're just going to let it develop on its own and that her systems can shut down before they give her something. That's not good. No. So I, I fought like the... Uh, the sun bear I am. I'm not a mama or papa bear. <laughs> sun bear. Yeah. So I uh, I became the uh, asshole I can become. And uh, I fought with two doctors to get her, tr her treated this week. So, yeah. For you. Good boy. Yeah. So she uh, ended up getting treatment for that. Um, then, uh, then my car decided to give out on me. Oh, no. I mean, like the entire cooling system dropped out. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. You want to talk about Mercury retrograde kicking you in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my, my car has been so re reliable and dependable. And then, boom, the entire cooling system kicks out. Unbelievable. Anyway, so if you guys want to help out, uh, the store, the Darkness Radio store <laughs> is open. You can buy <laughs> buy an item, get something for your money. Help Timmy get his car fixed. Yeah, help me get my car fixed. Thank God. I, I You know, I ne almost never do plugs for things that don't advertise here on this show, but thank God I have Car Shield. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a de deductible with Car Shield, but I mean, one of the smartest moves I've ever made. There you go. Just saying. Little free advertising for Car Shield. Yeah, there you go, Car Shield. You got a, you got a free ad here. So I'm googling it right now. There you go. See. So, um, so with all this catastrophic stuff that happens in my life, and thank God for friends and all the friends that have been around and and you know shouting encouragement and everything. I'm sitting out on the porch uh, on Sunday night kind of licking my wounds. And I'm saying to myself, I'm, you know, I'm trying not to be negative. I don't ever try to be negative in, in situations like that. I'm just thinking at least I have, you know, I've got good health lately. I've had good health. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the week ahead and, and things I got to do. And, you know, I got Michigan Paracon coming up, which is a good thing. So I'm counting my blessings. And Spud is running back and forth, Right. And I'm, you know, Spud and the different chipmunks are running back and forth. Spud yeah. and, and Spud and Indy, and they're they're kind of going back and forth and fighting with each other a little bit as they they're tend to do. And I'm trying to keep them separated, and I'm telling them no fighting, no fighting. And I'm throwing peanuts their way, trying to keep them, you know, separated. <laughs> peanut to you, peanut to you. And then I notice that you know Spud at the front of the sidewalk has her little den there now. And there's a little rock in front of her den and she's sitting on the rock and she's chirping and it sounds like a bark, but she's doing it for like 15 minutes straight. Oh, I'm like, what is she barking at? And it's almost like she's on top of the rock, which is really cool. I got this picture. I got to show you this picture of her. Yeah. I took this at sunset, right? And those of you who are watching on video will see this, this picture of her and you'll be like, oh, wow. It almost looks like this picture of her almost looks like um, <laughs> I call it the Luke Skywalker picture because it looks like a picture of Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. Oh, 
and she's looking at the sunset. But she yeah. she sits on that rock and she looks at the sunset instead of sitting up on the porch now with me. And I was wondering why she's sitting on that rock. And that rock is right next to the opening of her den. Okay. And that's where protecting something, right? Right. So she was on this rock and she's, and she's barking like, and I'm like, it seems like she's calling something. And I'm wondering what she's calling. Well, she's barking on this rock for about 15 minutes. I look to my left because I see movement. And here's this little baby chipper. Oh, you got baby chipmunks? There's one. One little baby Aww, chipper. How sweet. And in this little bush, there's this guy. Oh, look at it. And we named That's him. That's the sweetest thing. We named him Chili. Cute. I love Chili. So... This little guy was was in the bush, and I, I'm guessing he's probably, hmm, being that Spud had him out. And we know it's Spuds because after Chili came out of the bush and we, we, we got him to take a couple of peanuts, he knows how to crack, crack them open and, and, and take them out and eat them. So he's got to be at least six to eight weeks. Yeah. Um, not quite because she hasn't kicked him out of the den yet because she, when she called them, <laughs> she took him back to her den and then they, they, they oh. both went in together. So cute. So she hasn't kicked him out of the den yet, but I got, uh, I got another picture of him here hanging on for dear life onto the, there's another one of them hanging on for dear life. Oh, he's adorable. Yeah. You can't be mad at life when you got that little thing running around. No. So he was. He was, uh, and there's another one of them there in the in the tr in the bush. Oh, that's my favorite. Yeah, he so he's just uh, yeah. So he was just uh, scooting around, and then Mama called him in for for literally she she called him in for bed last night. And that's what she was doing. She was she was yelling as the street lights came on. And he, yeah, kind of like back in the '80s, like our parents did. Yeah. So she she yelled at him to come in, and he came in. And she got him to bed, and then she came back out, and she got a couple a couple loads of seeds. Oh! And then I said goodnight to her, and as the sun was going down, she was watching the sunset go down. And she was protecting the protecting the den. That's so sweet. Yeah, and I thought, you know what? Yeah, life can't be that bad. It nope. just can't be. Life is good. Yeah. So there's a new little baby in the neighborhood. So life moves on. And with that, we shall talk about how life moves on and in circles and whatnot and in cycles. Um, one of our first stories today, Jess, has to do with a barrage of solar explosions that could bring auroras to the U.S. this weekend. We're going to have the Ooh. Perseid meteor showers. We love meteor showers. Yeah. So three powerful solar eruptions could bring auroras as far south as New York and Idaho, right at the peak of the Perseid meteor shower this weekend. Three high-speed solar explosions known as coronal mass ejections, I always laugh whenever I say those words, uh, are set to slam into Earth's magnetic field this weekend, bringing stunning auroras as far south as New York and Idaho, striking Earth in succession. Uh, as uh, the, the CMEs will coincide with the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, if geomagnetic storm is triggered, uh, the sun eruptions will create a curtain of shifting light through which the bright tails of the Perseid shooting stars can be seen. Now, NOAA predicts possible auroras this weekend in the northern parts of most states along the U.S.-Canadian border, including Washington, Idaho, Montana, North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, and Maine. Uh, the third and final CME, which burst from the sun's surface on August 8th, is moving faster than 1,000 kilometers or 2.2 million miles per hour, and it will likely arrive, uh, well, it says here no later than August 11th, so it might have already passed us, but... Uh, adding its effect to that of two earlier CMEs uh, already en route. Now, CMEs originate from sunspots, regions on the sun's surface where powerful magnetic fields created by the flow of electrical charges coil into knots before erupt abruptly snapping. 
The massive energy release can eject giant plumes of solar material from the sun's surface uh, out into the solar system. Once launched, CMEs travel millions of miles per hour, sweeping up charged particles from the solar wind to form giant combined wave fronts. So kind of an interesting little story. Yeah. Our next story is quite interesting in that there's a paper out there proposing a new way to calculate the number of alien civilizations. Now, I know we, a lot of times, we'll talk about, well, there's no way to truly know how many alien civilizations are out there. This new paper claims they know. In a new study, scientists take on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or the SETI community and determine that they may have a crisis of imagination. Speaking to Universe Today, Columbia astronomer and paper co-author David Kipping suggested that the so-called SETI optimists may be missing the forest for the trees as they seek answers within our Milky Way. Known for his Cool Worlds vlog on YouTube, Kipping and co-writer Geraint Lewis of the University of Sydney's Institute for Astronomy posits in their new, or rather in their not for rather in their not yet peer-reviewed paper that one of the most famous equations for calculating the probable number of civilizations in our galaxy may well fall short. Back in 1961, famed astronomer Frank Drake assembled the first ever SETI meeting at West Virginia's Green Bank Observatory. It was at that inaugural meeting that he devised what is now known as the Drake Equation, intended as an exercise in imagination that outlines all the variables for detecting advanced life elsewhere in our galaxy. The equation, which attempts to estimate how many civilizations there are in the galaxy based on numerous variables ranging from the rate of star formation to the fraction of civilizations that eventually develop broadcast technology, has become something of a punching bag, which, per Kipping and Lewis's re reckoning, is a shame. Uh, it be comes or it's become a bit of a sport to critique the Drake equation, Kipping told UT. Certainly, anyone using it as a calculator should be fairly criticized, but the basic idea is not wrong. There must be some number of civilizations out there, and we could, in principle, collect relevant parameters to calculate it. With the Drake equation and others like it concerned with the exactitudes of extraterrestrial life, these astronomers are offering a radical reduction, an equation whose only variables are the birth rate and death rate of alien civilizations. They are kipping bemoaned. We often get caught up arguing about which parameters to include, but it's completely undeniable that every civilization must have a beginning and an end. When doing calculations along this birth-death version of the Drake equation, the possibilities arise that humanity simply happened to come about during a time when other extraterrestrial civilizations in our galaxy are rare or non-existent. Even if that's true, though, there could be plenty more beyond it. He says, I think my favorite way out is that our galaxy is just unusually quiet. Most are busy and filled but we are the first in the Milky Way, Kipping concluded. This seems improbable, but perhaps being born in a busy galaxy is impossible since the habitable real estate has already been gobbled up. This suggests we should put more emphasis on extra ga galactical uh, SETI as our best shot. So he kind of just says we're taking a shot in the dark by being here. <laughs> I don't know. Fair enough. I mean, that, that seems odd, but okay. <laughs> Not very scientific. No, no, I, I, it's more of a guess than anything else. Uh, you know, we had Dr. Charles Liu on the program on Thursday talking about uh, quantum physics and different scenarios in the paranormal and how they relate to quantum physics. There's a new story yeah. out there, Jess, that says now that there's a quantum solution to the Fermi paradox. And that is that this study is suggesting that aliens could use interstellar quantum communication technology to hide their chats with one another. So in other words, hmm. they're slipping under the radar using quantum physics. I told you Maybe. guys, I told you guys this stuff would come in dandy. <laughs> you didn't believe me. Either that or they, they were listening to the show and just decided to use what we were That's doing. That's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. 
Um, now, the Fermi paradox suggests that the vastness of the universe should contain many civilizations that are able to communicate, but that there's little evidence of those signals. Current search for extraterrestrials are focused on detecting radio waves or laser signals sent across interstellar distances. Now, researchers suggesting the next leap in SETI may lie in exploring quantum communications for hints of conversations among aliens. A recent study by Canadian researchers suggests that the leap in SETI may lie in the realm of quantum communication. This new take on that long-standing puzzle might not just explain the enigmatic Fermi paradox and give a boost to quantum communication research, but who knows? Even get us on the same wavelength with our extraterrestrial neighbors. Quantum communication is a field that explores the transmission of information using quantum bits or quibits. I used to play quibit in the arcade. You remember that little guy who <laughs> hops from box to box? I know that one, yeah. yeah that's a good game. Uh, unlike classical bits, which can be either zeros or ones, like Dr. Charles Liu explained when he was here on Thursday, quibits can exist in superpositions of both states simultaneously. This unique property allows quantum communication to perform certain tasks that classical communication cannot, such as quantum cryptography cryptography, easy for me to say, teleportation, and super dense coding. In a study published, uh, Latham Boyle from the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics, University of Edinburgh, UK, and the Perimeter uh, Institute for Theoretical Physics, they investigated the feasibility of interstellar quantum communication and its implication for SETI. Boyle argues that the photon quibits can retain their quantum co coherence over interstellar and even intergalactic distances, raising the prospect of interstellar quantum communication. This concept suggests that civilizations could communicate using quantum signals rather than classical signals that would be imperceptible with current SETI methods, which is completely, I mean, feasible and, and completely imaginable that that they could do it that way and there is some constraint to it they, they talk about wavelength constraints in this in this article that the photon wavelengths must be less than 26.5 centimeters to avoid interference by cosmic microwave backgrounds Boyle explained that using constraints on quantum depolarizing channels and properties of the diffuse astrophysical background radiation they show that uh to sex, uh, successfully transmit quantum information, the exchange photons need to have certain properties. They talk about a telescope size as well. But they talk about how it's much more feasible to use quantum communication than it is to use radio waves because radio waves take so long to get across the universe. Yeah, I'm glad there are smarter people in the world than me who can figure this stuff out. <laughs> me too, I, I, <laughs> I, I'd have a harder time, uh, you know, but that's why we had, I love hearing about it. Yeah. That's why we had Dr. Charles Liu on the program, because uh, if you, if you haven't listened to, to Thursday's program yet, don't, don't think that your mind is going to shut down. He did a very good job of explaining everything on Thursday. If you haven't yeah, listened to he it, did. so uh, check it out in the archives, darknessradioshow.com. All right, Jess, our next story has to do with a school janitor who spotted a UFO in the skies above a farm in 1974, but kept the alien secret until now. 67-year-old Gordon Macarac Macaracker? Macaracker. It's like What a great name. <laughs> it's like Burt Bacharach. It's hard to say, but you get the idea. Uh, says he knows what he saw in the sky in West Lothian, Scotland, and explained why it has taken 50 years to tell the tale of the day he will never forget. A retired primary school janitor says he finally decided to open up about the moment he saw a UFO hovering menacingly over a farm more than 50 years ago. Keeping what he spotted in the sky uh, in West Lothian, Scotland, a secret for five decades, Gordon Macaracker said he, <laughs> that name makes me giggle, says okay. he's had a, enough of worrying what people think and has decided to share his story. In 1974, on a brisk autumn night, Gordon says he left the cottage of a girl he was dating to travel down the old road connecting Kirk Newton and East Calder. 
He said at 17 years old, he was working on Ormiston Farm, rolling and plowing fields and enjoying his youth. Uh, But his perception of the universe was irreversibly changed when he decided to look up into the sky during his walk home to his parents' cottage. Gordon, who now lives in Newbridge, described seeing a brown metallic conical structure that was the size of a caravan floating around 100 feet above his head and traveling silently toward Bathgate and Deckmont. The 67-year-old remembers watching the aircraft as he hurriedly made his way to phone air traffic control at Edinburgh Airport from a phone box at the end of Langton Road. But after calling staff at the control tower, he claims that he was told that no aircraft had entered or left the surrounding airspace in the past hour. I was walking from the cottage at Ormiston Farm at around 9.30 to 10 p.m., and back in the day, it was a straight road down to East Calder, he said. I don't know why, but I looked to my left, and in the sky above me, there was this brown conical craft traveling in total silence. I could see the moonlight shining off it. It was funny, as I don't remember being scared when I watched it, although it is possible I was at this time, or at the time. I headed to the phone box on Langton Road, which was about a 20-minute walk, and phoned the control tower at the airport. I told them I saw a conical object flying in the sky that was completely silent. They went away to check, and when the guy came back, he told me that nothing had taken off or arrived at Edinburgh in the past hour. He said that their radar did not capture anything during that time either. At first, I thought it was maybe circling around to land at Edinburgh Airport, but obviously not. I just told the controller that it didn't matter, and I headed home. <laughs> so you see this giant craft in the sky, and you go, it's 100 feet away, and you're like, oh, my gosh, this changed my life, and that nah, doesn't matter. I'm going. No big deal. Yeah. Gordon describes bottling up his experience as he did not want to be branded an idiot or associated as someone who saw space people. The first time he opened up was several years later to his wife, Margaret, when they were watching a show that mentioned something about extraterrestrial encounters. His experience stayed in the family with his son, Ross, who also was learning of what happened 50 years ago. Despite his concern around other people's perceptions, Gordon grew in confidence after reading Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, which contained a near identical drawing of a UFO craft that was spotted by a Yorkshireman around the same time. I never told a soul, Gordon continued. I was too scared because I did not want to be classified as an idiot. So I just kept quiet about it. And when I got back to my parents, uh, not once did I think my mind was playing tricks on me, as I knew exactly what I saw. I had no interest in UFOs at the time, nor did I even think about them or anything like that. The first time I mentioned it, I was it was after I got married And something came on TV about UFOs. I told my wife about the encounter, and she just said, okay. I later told my son about it as well. Neither of them are really believers or non-believers. It never really comes up between us. I remember being taken aback when I read Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World in my mid-20s, and I came across a paragraph in the book about a Yorkshireman having a similar experience. He drew a picture of the craft, and I said, oh my God, that's exactly what I saw. It has the heavy bottom going up to a point. Earlier this year, Gordon joined a Facebook group, UFOs in Scotland. He began to read other people's stories and made the decision to share his own alleged encounter with like-minded people. I read other stories that people had shared and decided to share my own, he added. The response was incredible. With maturity, I decided I did not care if people thought I was an idiot or seeing things. I thought, why should people keep this in? I, uh, people, kept, or people can call me whatever they want, Uh, Hundreds of people reacted to my story with some reaching out and getting in touch. I did not realize that communities of like-minded people existed. The area where Gordon claims to have encountered the UFO has been developed with busy roads and homes built up over the years, completely transforming the once secluded spot. Returning to the site of the encounter with Edinburgh Alive, Gordon said he does not believe we are alone in the universe and he's open-minded to whatever's out there. I wish I could see it again, honestly. I would love to see it, he said. I do believe there's something out there, to be honest with you. I hope I'm not coming across wrong, but we cannot be the only beings in the whole universe. We can't be. It's impossible to think like that. There must be something out there. So there you go. Former janitor who believes there's something out there. 
Can you imagine thinking that people would think you were an idiot if you talked about UFOs? <laughs> I think a lot of people think I'm an idiot. Just saying. <laughs> And they tell me so on the internet every every oh, week or so. I just so. think it's so sad when you hear me. These people are like, I lived with this for 50 years because I didn't want people to think I was weird or dumb or crazy. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I like live to talk about this stuff. I wonder what people think about me. No, well, people are going to tell you what they think anyway. So why not just live your life and say what you say? You know? Yeah, let them let them think you're fun at least. Yeah, have a good time. <laughs> have a good time about it. That's what I got to say. Well, I'll tell you what, Jess, we're going to take our break. When we come back, Elon Musk is back, and he says that genuinely useful humanoid robots are coming next year. Oh, heavens. I get to say if there's anything like that truck he's got out, they're going to blow up in our face. We'll That's talk, so weird. We'll talk <laughs> about that when we come back. we got lots of ghost stories on the horizon today. Lots of ghost stories on the horizon Yay. today. We're going to tell you about a dog man story. There's a dog man story out there this week. So we're going to talk Favorite. about That's right. We're going to talk about dog man. We have got an unusual story about a young boy who survived unscathed from a floor from the 60 or from a, a 16th floor fall. I'll get that out of my mouth eventually. What? 16 floors straight down unscathed. We'll talk about it after the break and we'll wrap up today's story or today's show with a story about irony irony you truly will become a believer after today's <laughs> final story if you don't become a believer i got i got worries about you and i want to clarify my my position on cats today it came up in the chat room. <laughs> you not like cats? No, no, no. Well, no, we're going to talk about that, Jess. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll talk about it during the show today. It's all coming up. It's the Supernatural News Wednesday. Supernatural News and Parashare. We do need your Parashare, by the way. Uh, send your Parashare experiences in. Tim at DarknessRadio.com. You can email them. Go to our website, DarknessRadioShow.com. Click on that blue button. Send us a voice note. Two ways you can do it. Or if you have your own studio, produce your own theater of the mind, send it in. Sound effects, music, I'll screen it. I'll, I'll air it here on the program. That's how you do it. When we come back, robots, ghosts, and falling from a building. Oh, my. It's all coming up next on Supernatural News right here on the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Programming. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Right over there is Jessica Freeberg. Jess, I told you it's been a rough week, but you know what? Yeah. Things look up. Things look good. I got a little chili out there. Little, little baby, little baby, baby chili is so out there running around. I was so happy to see chili crack open that first peanut. And, you know, it was just, I don't know. I can't wait to see little chili again. That's, that's what I've been thinking about all day, just seeing a little baby chipper. Little baby chippers are... cutie. Little baby chippers are just the cutest thing. They are. They really are. I don't even have chipmunks at my house, so I'm so jealous of your chipmunks. They're the cutest things ever. You don't have chipmunks at your house? I've never seen one. No? Squirrels and bunnies. That's it. Yeah? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I did see Arnold the other day. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. a troublemaker, but he's cute. Yeah, oh, he's huge. Well, he's he's now the size of a uh, a deer. Yeah, he's yeah he's gotten huge. I don't know when he's sneaking Aww. in and eating all the food, but he is. Yeah, how can you be anything but happy with all this adorable wildlife in your yard? Well, I'll tell you, it's uh. Ah! That's how I can't be happy. Oh no! Because AI sneaks up on me. Just trying to start to get happy. AI sneaks up on me. Specifically, Elon Musk. Is he not a happy person? 
Is this... I think he wants to just make us all miserable. Yeah, I think he wants to be an artificial being. Even his personality is artificial. Maybe he is a robot. I think he is. I think he's a robot. Speaking of, Elon Musk says genuinely useful humanoid robots are coming next year. Oh, joy. You can put one under my tree. Tesla will be putting humanoid robots into production within months, according to the firm's CEO, Steve Benford and Praminda Caleb Solly. Put the announcement out from Elon Musk Musk's and his recent announcement on Twitter that Tesla will have genuinely useful humanoid robots in low production for Tesla's internal use next year. Oh, so there won't be one under my tree unless I put my tree over at Tesla. <laughs> uh, it suggests that robots will have physical human-like characteristics and provide genuinely useful function and that they might be with us soon. However, despite decades of trying, useful humanoid robots have remained a fiction that never seems to quite catch up with reality. Are we finally on the crux of a breakthrough? It's relevant to question whether we really need humanoid robots at all. Tesla's Optimus robot is just one of several emerging humanoid robots joining the likes of Boston Dynamics Atlas, Figure AI's Figure 01, Sanctuary AI's Phoenix, and many others. They usually take the form of bipedal platform that is variously capable of walking and sometimes jumping along with other athletic feats. On top of this platform, a pair of robot arms and hands may be mounted that are capable of manipulating objects with various degrees of dexterity and uh, tactility. I thought that said facility for a second, but it's tactility. Uh, <laughs> behind the eyes lies artificial intelligence tailored to planning navigation, recognizing objects, and carrying out tasks with these objects. The most commonly... Uh, envisaged uses or uses for such robots are in factories carrying out repetitious, dirty, dull, and dangerous tasks and working alongside humans collaboratively carrying a ladder together, for example. They are also proposed for work and service industry roles, perhaps replacing the current generation of more utilitarian meet and greet and tour guide service robots. They could possibly be used in social care. Oh God, no, no, no. Uh, where there have been attempts to lift and move humans, like the Riken Row Bear. Admittedly, this was more bear than humanoid, and to deliver personal care and therapy. I don't know. I don't know if I like a therapy bot. I don't think so. I don't. I don't no. like any of it. I'll be honest. But no. uh, there's also a more established and growing market in humanoid sex robots. I I did not bring this up. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't look up the article just for this. Um, no. Um, no. Interestingly, it says here, while many people recognize the moral and ethical issues related to these, the use of humanoid robots in other areas seems to attract less controversy. It is, however, proving challenging to deliver humanoid robots in practice. Why should this be so, it asks. Well, there are numerous engineering challenges, such as achieving flexible bipedal locomotion on different terrain. It took humans about 4 million years to achieve this. So where are we now with humanoid robots is pretty impressive. But humans learn to combine a complex set of sensing capabilities to achieve this feat. Similarly, achieving the dexterous manipulation of objects, which come in all shapes, sizes, weights, levels of fragility, is proving stubborn with robots. There has been significant progress, though, such as the dexterous hands from UK company Shadow Robot. Uh, compared to the human body that is covered in a soft, flexible skin that continuously senses and adapts to the world, robots' tactile capabilities are limited to only a few points of contact, such as fingertips. Moving beyond automating specific tasks on factory assembly lines to improving general tasks on a dynamic world demands greater progress in artificial intelligence as well as sensing and mechanical capabilities. Finally, if you're going to make a robot look human, then there is an exception, or, or an expectation rather, that it would so need to communicate with us like a human, perhaps even respond emotionally. Which at that point becomes creepy. I don't know. 
I mean, it was creepy before, but yes, that's extra next level creepy. Yeah. Speaking of next level creepy, if you're ready for this. The father of artificial intelligence is going to be brought back from the dead by AI. No, no. Irony of all ironies, speaking of irony. (laughs) Uh, The father of AI is going to be brought back from the dead by AI. Technology icon Alan Turing will be resurrected as a life-size avatar at his World War II code-breaking base of Bletchley Park, Buckinghamshire, where he slaved to solve the Nazis' top-secret messages. Turing's recordings and records are about to be pumped into the virtual version of the mathematician, so it will speak exactly like the tech genius. Uh, Rebecca Foy, uh, Bletchley Park's director of public engagement, said... Even without his wartime work, he would rightly be famous for his pioneer computing work. Visitors will be able to pose questions to the AI Allen, and the digital avatar will respond as if it is having a real-time conversation. It is being created by the firm 1956 Individuals, and it's hoped to be ready by early next year. The digital touring will initially appear for chats life-size on a screen. There are also plans to have it interact on mobile phones and tablets. John Hart, digital partnerships manager at 1956 Individuals, said the AI is not able to research or rather to search the Internet or wider answers or hallucinate, make things up. We can control the knowledge that it has. The Turing family has given its backing to the project and are hoping it will improve knowledge of his work and earn him an army of new fans. His nephew, Sir Dermot Turing, said, lots of people come to Bletchley Park to get a bit closer to Alan, and this will be a fun way to do that. Creepily fun. Ew. Super creepy. Former Prime Minister Rishi Biggles Sunak last year held an AI safety summit at Bletchley Park amid fears that the tech was set to rob millions of jobs and cause global security risks. Turing's name is still shrouded in urban myths and mystery. Uh, He is considered a gay icon for how he openly lived as a homosexual, despite it being illegal at the time. Uh, His name is constantly referred to in science fiction and wartime films, as he is most famed for being the Enigma codebreaker behind decrypting Nazi messages. The Enigma enciphering machine, adopted by the German armed forces, is securely or to securely send directives during World War II, was believed to be unbreakable until Turing cracked it as part of a research team working at Bletchley Park. He's credited with shortening the war by up to four years and was awarded an OBE in 1945. Turing went on to work at the National Physical Laboratory, where he designed the automatic computing engine, one of the first designs for a stored program computer. His Turing test, originally called the imitation game, is still used in the development of AI and tests whether a computer is capable of thinking like a human. And we've we've had stories before, Jess, about the Turing tests and whether, and I believe there was a computer that passed the Turing test or got past the Turing test recently. Yeah. Um, which I don't know. I I always get creeped out when when someone wants to bring somebody back in a full hologram as an AI and, and wants to interact with it and say, "Here he is, back to life." Yeah, it's just so weird, and I don't know. I mean, it's kind of cool though because he's such an icon. So mm-hmm. it might be fun for educational purposes to bring back an icon like that to chat with them. Yeah. At least to to learn what he did. But, uh, you know, if if you start getting into, so if you could record an album with Tupac, you know, (laughs) yeah, that's, that's a little weird, but yeah. Meanwhile, the first truly human cyborg we're going to burn with fire is in the Guinness Book of World Records. And she says... Even my husband's ashes are inside me. Wow. She's creepy. 
She is creepy with a capital K. Here's a picture of her. Oh. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about her. I don't know that I trust her. Anastasia Sin. That's S-Y-N-N. Anastasia Sin. That's her real name? No, I think it's a... Yeah, I think... Yeah. Works as a stunt and magic performer, has 52 metal chips, some of which are magnetic, inserted into her body, and she has big plans for cyborg dentures. What? I can't. I don't. Okay. Yeah, fellas, she's single, evidently, because her husband's ashes are inside of her. That would probably be the only thing inside of her, if you know what I mean. I don't know. Some people might like that kind of thing. Some people are into that kind of thing. <laughs> Little po- posthumous threesome. <laughs> you. What? A cyborg woman who holds an unusual implant world record has revealed the surprising location of her husband's ashes. <laughs> no, we're not going there. I'm just saying. <laughs> Anastasia Sin, who works as a stunt magic performer, landed the Guinness world record for the most technological implants in the body for a female in February of 2023 in Milan. She has 52 metal chips, some of which are magnetic, inserted in her body which allow her to complete various tasks, including opening videos on her phone, making calls and opening doors. I just... Um, okay. In a new YouTube video, however, Anastasia has explained how some have a more sentimental purpose, including two that serve as a reminder of her late husband, John Edward, I believe this is Celez, or the amazing Jonathan. I wasn't aware that, oh, I was aware that Amazing Jonathan died. That's right. Anastasia said, the ones that mean the most to me are the ones that remember my husband. So I have a chip here in my heart that when I scan it with my phone, it actually, it's not in my heart. It's on my heart. Uh, She proceeded to place her phone on her chest near the implant and an automated voice responded with, this is the day I married my best friend. Oh, that's so sad yeah. and weird. And weird, <laughs> but sad. The <laughs> phone automatically played a sweet video of the couple's wedding with her husband shown walking down the aisle with a big Coca-Cola and glasses. Oh, that's yeah. really just touching in the strangest way. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. <laughs> Anastasia continued, and then I also have one on my my implant of his ashes. There's a heart-shaped locket here on her arm and his ashes and a magnet in there. That's a tattoo of him. And when you scan the ashes, you get his memorial. And the song makes me so sad. It was a really great memorial. He'll be with me forever now. Anastasia explained, that's kind of creepy that his ashes are right there. Uh, Anastasia explained how she made the implant herself, purchasing the locket and adding the magnets and her husband's remains. She also described how she has a handy implant located in her knee that allows her to open her front door when her hands are full of groceries. So wild. Yeah. Another implant will call 911 once it's scanned with her phone, but the possibilities seem to be endless. And she said others light up when she touches a hotel door and another operates as a temperature chip. Anastasia said she previously had a computer in her leg and had a dent from wearing it for three years after removing it. Uh, But then she went on to have a second one inserted. A computer in her leg. Just didn't even know that these were options. Yeah, I know. My doc doesn't talk to me about any of this stuff. Yeah. Very strange. I guess you got to have a really good insurance plan. However, she doesn't plan to stop there as she now plans to have cyborg dentures. It would involve removing her molars and adding a USB tooth, a push button that flashes vampire fangs, and also becoming a human radio. Jess, thinking about cyborg fangs anytime soon? Um, No. Do you want a USB drive in your tooth? I do not. No? No. You want to get Spotify in your teeth? 
No. I mean, the, the one that opens a door for her when she has a handful of groceries sounds, that's a little interesting to me. Yeah, that, I could go for that. I could go You're for the... It's kind of strange. Yeah, I want to keep my own teeth. I, think I don't if, need to be a radio. I think if I have to get the knees done, if I have to get the knees replaced, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the door unlocker with the, the knee replacement. That's actually, that's handy. Yeah, that is. I think they should offer that in all knee replacements. <laughs> I like that one. The rest of the stuff I, I could do without. That's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Let's move on. Uh, let's talk about experiences on the other side. This lady, Amanda Prowse, says that her brother died and a strange light guided her home. She says she just can't explain it. Amanda Prowse was left devastated when she discovered her younger brother, Simon, had suddenly died. Shocked and overwhelmed, but with a huge journey home ahead to see her family, a strange presence guided her safely back. One woman says she's never been religious or spiritual and believes her late brother may have helped her guide, or guide may, may have helped guided her home. My English not good right now. It's hard sometimes. Yeah, words is hard. 56-year-old Amanda Prowse has always been content in her belief that when people die, that's their end. I'm very practical and logical in the way that I look at the world. I think we're like plants, she said. We live and then we die. Our bodies go into the ground and then we become part of the earth. However, when her younger brother Simon died suddenly, the aftermath changed her perception, leaving her unable to explain what happened in any other way. Speaking exclusively to the mirror, Amanda recalled that fateful day in September of 2022. She said, when my husband Simeon, called to say Simon had had a heart attack. I was really confused. I thought he was mistaken and meant my dad because he'd had heart surgery a year or so before. I couldn't fathom it. Simon was always so fit and healthy. We always described him as invincible. He loved being active. He didn't smoke. And he'd always been out and about walking and hiking. He was only 50 years old, Amanda said. She knew he had died when she asked her husband which hospital, which hospital he was being taken to. And he replied saying that he was in the best possible hands. She said, I knew as he said that Simon had died. Otherwise, he would have told me where to go to be with him. The ambulance arrived in minutes and the paramedics tried everything they could. There was even a heart surgeon and a heart specialist with them who had come along after hearing the news. If there was anything they could have done to have saved him, they would have done it. Stunned by the news, Amanda could only think of getting to her family. She went on, it was like the world turned in slow motion. My legs felt like they didn't belong to me. I'm the oldest. I know my mom and dad and Simon's daughter, Emily, I believe, would need me to be there. The problem was that Amanda was in, is this Ulfracombe, North Devon, uh, and had to drive over 100 miles to Bristol. She said, I got in the car and I just thought, I don't know if I can do this. I was in shock. I knew it wasn't safe to drive, feeling such overwhelming grief, but I had to get to them. It was so dark and drizzly. It was such rubbish weather. That was when Amanda caught sight of a strange orange light in the sky, visible in the top corner of her windscreen. She said, it was like a spark, like a firework. I didn't even question it. I just thought, okay, when I looked at it, it gave me strength. It made me calm. I was trembling, but every time I felt like I couldn't do it, I looked at the light and it comforted me. How, however, uh, that was only the beginning of Amanda's strange journey. After driving for almost an hour and a half, she discovered the only road to the motorway was blocked off after a car had driven off a cliff. Police had taped off the area and were turning people around. She said, I hadn't cried yet at that point because I burst into tears at the frustration of it all and feeling so panicked. I begged the police officer to let me pass, but he refused. Then another man came over. He had a helmet on. I'm not sure if he was police or a firefighter. He lifted up his visor and told me, do it for Josh. Go steady. It was bizarre. My son is called Josh. How could he have known that I needed to hear those words to calm myself? Amanda says that the orange spark appeared to glow brighter at this, and she continued on her journey. She went on, that light shone all the way home, and I kept looking at it, and I spoke to Simon. I told him I would look after my niece. 
that I would look after my parents and that I would be and that all would be okay. I had moments of almost euphoria where I would recall funny and loving memories. It was all just bizarre. I didn't move and it didn't dim. When Amanda pulled into the driveway of her family's home, she said she looked up at the light and it dimmed and then it went out. She finished. I feel it brought me safely home. I just can't explain it. I don't know what it was, and I think about it a lot. After several days of being overwhelmed with grief and all the paperwork that comes when someone dies, Amanda says she almost forgot about her otherworldly journey. However, when she mentioned it to her other brother, Paul, he revealed that he'd had a similar experience at the same time that he was driving. Amanda said, I think we were grieving. I think when we're grieving, we look for coincidences to help us, like seeing a robin or a white feather and instantly assuming that it's a sign from above. But I can't explain that small orange spark that day. It was with me the whole way home and only went when I was safe. It brings me peace and great comfort. Uh, we're all just energy at the end of the day. She went on to say, there's a window that day that Simon looked through to help me. We just don't know. The experience has definitely made me question and less fearful of death. The only per people who are suffering post losing Simon is us. It isn't Simon. He had the best weekend before he died. He saw his friends, his family, his daughter. He had five wonderful decades of life, which is a lot more than some people get. Amanda is a best-selling author who used her grief and channeled it into her latest book, Swimming to Lundy, the novel about how it's never too late to follow your dreams and find your way back to happiness after tragedy is out now. So there you go. That's a cool story. Yeah. Most definitely. Got another ghost story here, and we're back in London, where ghost stories are abound of one of London's most haunted tunnels. We're talking about East London's Blackwall Tunnel, which stretches underneath the Thames, and it remains a hot spot for ghostly tales. There's something strange lurking in the tunnels beneath London's iconic river that is, at least according to reports of ghosts, phantom hitchhikers and other weirdness encountered there by motorists over the years. According to one particularly well-known and haunting tale, a motorcyclist who was passing through Blackwall Tunnel had stopped to pick up a hitchhiker who had wanted to be dropped off at Leon Sea in Essex. The story goes that by the time the motorcyclist had reached the end of the tunnel, his mysterious passenger had completely disappeared. Curious, he later visited the address given to him by the hitchhiker and discovered that the man he had supposedly picked up had in fact died in a motorcycle accident several years prior. Ooh. Yeah. According to reports, a motorcyclist had indeed died in a fatal crash inside the tunnel back in 1960. Phantom sounds were also later heard at the same location. The tunnel itself has certainly seen more than its fair share of tragedy over the years, with seven men having died during its construction back at the tail end of the 19th century. And they ask, could ghosts truly be haunting its dark interior? Well, I think probably, yeah. I mean... I'd say yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a fair shot. Now, I got to ask you this question here, Jess. Um, I believe we're staying in London for this next one. Haunted pubs. Are you, a, are you a fan and do you believe that pubs are a, a huge source of hauntings? Oh, sure. I'm definitely a believer in haunted pubs. And, you know, partly because I think energy is attracted to places that they had a good time at and that makes them happy. So it makes perfect sense that spirits would return. We have a story here about a pub that's haunted by Nellie the Ghost, who supposedly takes money from wealthy looking visitors. Oh, go Nelly. <laughs> she's a she's a, a bit of a pickpocket. Uh, perched <laughs> on a bustling road just outside Clevedon, there's a former village pub steeped in macabre history, complete with its own resident specter known as Nelly, who enjoys startling both patrons and staff at the Drum and Monkey in Ken. That's a great name for a pub, the Drum and Monkey. I love it. We should we should start our own pub here called Drum and Mon Monkey and have actual monkeys in it. Right. Playing drums. Yes. Right. The entrance to the pub is marked by wooden stocks, a stark reminder that it was near this spot where some of the last public executions in the area were witnessed. 
The infamous Ken hangings of the 1830s involved three men, 35-year-old William Wall, 30-year-old John Rowley, and just 19-year-old Richard Clark, who was set ablaze who set ablaze wheat stacks owned by a farmer that they accused of informing on them for illicit cider sales. Like, I thought you said they set him ablaze, and I was like, what? No, I know. I, a terrible I, way to kill someone. I know. I slipped there. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but boy, life was simpler back then. Set, yeah. set somebody's farm on fire just for uh, narking on them for cider sales. I mean, that's pretty simple. Their yeah. retribution was meted out in the hanging field adjacent to the pub. Boy, if more pubs these days had hanging fields, I'm just saying. I, they'd all be haunted. <laughs> That's right. Uh, an event purportedly attended by thousands, but the grim past isn't all that lingers at the drum and monkey. I love that name. Tales of haunting swirl around the establishment. Steve Dew, who's a former landlord, has recounted several eerie occurrences within the walls of the old pub. Mr. Dew, which, by the way, if he were a mountain, he'd be... Mountain Dew! Yeah, and he wouldn't have any teeth. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dew recalled, the drum is a very old pub. The upstairs is a very weird layout, a corridor with lots of small rooms off it. You would be at one end when suddenly a door would close on the other end. You would also get a sort of cold chill when walking around. It's hard to describe. There's allegedly a ghost that walks up and down the corridor. Two of the girls who used to work here claim to have seen her. There have been instances when chairs would move in the, di in the diner downstairs, and the girls used to think that they were playing pranks on each other. When they weren't, uh, when they weren't, not when they weren't, when they weren't, uh, the ghost was allegedly a woman called Nellie who used to work here. The drum is also featured in the book Haunted Pubs of the Southwest. The so-called Nellie No Change is a unique landlady known for miles around whose friendly form appears now and again. She got her name from the fact that whenever she welcomed wealthy looking guests, she would take their money with the words, there's no change. <laughs> assuming they could afford it. So she'd just take their change. <laughs> I like her style. Yeah. Other stories involve Nellie being spotted on the B313, which runs past the pub and into the neighboring village of Yatton. Uh, sadly, the pub is no more, having closed in September of 2021. In 2022, plans to convert the historic pub into offices were put forward. Oh, lame. But I'd take an office there. That'd be fun. Yeah, but there's no more pub. No more drum and monkey. I would make my office pub-ish. I would just drink alcohol at my desk all day out of a cup. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd call my Cheers. office the drum and monkey. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and then I'd take people's money and say, no change. No. Nope. Yeah, no, no change. That's a bummer, though. They should keep a place like that open. Yeah, I think so. Most definitely. Our next story has to do with mystery footprints attributed to a ghost of a dead local man in Thailand. Oh. Here's a picture of the mystery footprint, Jess, just so you can see it. Oh, yeah. Look at that. There it is. Yeah. That's definitely a footprint. That it is. Like a tennis shoe. It does look like a tennis shoe or a weird boot, that's for sure. Local residents say that the footprints led to the deceased man's house and won't wash away with water. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. In a strange story out of Thailand this week, residents of Rayong have claimed that mysterious footprints that have appeared outside their homes on the street are those of their deceased neighbor. The man known in the area as Uncle was a fisherman who would often visit a nearby shop. Bizarrely, the trail of phantom footprints seemed to stop at Uncle's house at one end of the trail and outside the shop at the other mimicking the route that he would often take. Residents initially believed that someone had been trying to pull a prank, but when CCTV footage of the street was reviewed to find out who was responsible, there was no sign of anyone. Wow, I yeah. love that story. Even stranger still is the fact that attempts to wash the footprints away have so far come up empty as the prints seem to mysteriously reappear on their own. Creepy. Mm -hmm. 
Just before Uncle had died, he claimed to have experienced a premonition in which he would purchase sweets for the local children if his fishing catch was particularly bountiful. Uh After he returned home, he fell in the bathroom and was pronounced dead at the hospital. So could Uncle's ghost be haunting the street outside his home, perhaps walking to the local shop to buy sweets for the local kids? Or is there another, more conventional explanation? That's for you to decide. I like the first explanation. He's going to get candy. I like that, too. I would like to think he's getting candy for the kids. Yeah. Here's another interesting mystery, Jess, and it has to do with a man who's become a ghost... Because of black magic. Mm. A man dies after uh, on a beach, just mysteriously on a beach, after performing a black magic ritual. Oh, wow. Creepy. Yeah. A 65-year-old man has been found dead on a beach in Spain after conducting some sort of strange ritual. The peculiar and disturbing case saw the body of a man being found behind some rocks on La Fosca Beach to the north of the Costa Brava Resort of Palamos, near Garona, Spain, this past week. In a bizarre twist, he was found surrounded by a circle of dead hens that he had seemingly decapitated as part of some form of black magic ritual. What? That is not cool. No. What those hens ever do to you? Well, he got in the way. Just saying. I guess. Yeah. Oh, I almost put it's a small world after all on instead of this right here instead of instead of a rim shot oh. dear god well it would be a small world after all wouldn't it i mean if uh, uh, i don't know i guess that's what you get for hitting the wrong button just saying <laughs> I, I meant to hit this there you go um police investigating the case believe that the man may have died from a reaction to certain substances he had taken prior to producing the ritual His wife, with whom he had rode prior to the incident, has raised the alarm after she found him unconscious on the ground at around 5 a.m. in the morning. So he had been out there all night. They're not currently treating the death as a crime. They're saying it's a natural death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His family normally natural. Yep, paranormally natural. His family will also not be held accountable for the animals that he slaughtered. Yeah. The true meaning and purpose of the ritual he was conducting, however, remains unclear. No one's not quite sure why he did the ritual he did. Maybe he was just trying to get more eggs. <laughs> it was an egg ritual. <laughs> once you, once you mess with the other end not the head but the tail i mean, I mean yeah, you know you want to do more of this and less of this <laughs> i mean <laughs> I just just saying that. i don't know I, huh. got an unusual story out of the boise foothills here jess they're on high alert because they say there's been a dog man sighting Ooh, i love dog man yeah well, i don't want to encounter him he seems a little nefarious but I, was I do say, love a good dog man story. Yeah, you can't you can't scratch him on the belly and throw him a bone. I mean, it's not that type of dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Boise has been excitedly buzzing over mysterious dog man sightings in the Boise Hills. His uh, this uh, cryptic friend uh, cryptic cryptid frenzy was reignited by Reddit user Sissy Bitch Ribs. Wow, what a name. Isn't that a name? What a wonderful name. Yeah. Who asked about the original Dogman sighting? This led to a whirlwind of community reactions. But what exactly is a Dogman? Well, according to Dogman Encounters, these creatures fall into two categories, canine type and type 3. There's also a type (laughs) 3 diabetic. I don't know, but I'm just saying it. Yeah. The canine type resembles an upright canine with dog-like legs, as we know. The type 3... Dog man looks more like a Sasquatch with a muzzle and claws instead of fingernails. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. These beings are reported to walk bipedally, a trait that adds to their eerie mystique. The first documented dog man encounter dates back to 1887 in Michigan, but sightings have spanned across the globe from North America to beyond. In Boise, the legend has added a delightful touch of whimsy to everyday life. That's sarcastic, by the way. Uh, Families are now 
taking evening strolls in the hills, not just for exercise, but in hopes of spotting the elusive dog man. Local artists have been inspired to create sketches and paintings, some of which now adorn galleries and coffee shops around town. The community's response has been a mix of skepticism and humor, but there's no denying the legend has sparked curiosity and creativity. There's even talk of organizing a dog man hunt. That's probably the worst idea in the history of worst ideas. I'm just saying. Don't do it. No, don't do it. A family friendly event, they're saying. Why is that family friendly? Uh, no. Where locals can dress up in cryptid hunting gear and explore the hills together. Man. That is bad, bad, bad. Get the family together to be decimated by dog man. <laughs> Come on, kids. Go find us a demon dog. Hey, kids, would you like to have your entrails scattered all over the hills? Let's go look <laughs> for dog man. It's all right. He's just going to follow us home and haunt us forever. Yeah, you'll like it. We can bring home a dog man. Next time you find yourself in the Boise Hills, keep your eyes peeled, it says here. You might just become part of this fascinating lore or be killed by it. And if you do spot those glowing red eyes, don't forget to snap a picture if you can get to your camera fast enough. If you survive. If you survive. After all, it's not every day you get to be a part of Boise's cryptid legend, it says here. I think they're taking it quite lightly. By the a little way. too lightly. Yeah. I will say my my book that I just finished a few a month ago or so, Monsters of the Pacific Northeast, the creepiest story I think by far in there is a dogman story from Twin Falls, Idaho, and it it really like chilled me to the bones to to write it and talk to the guy who experienced it, and he has photos of the footprints on his roof. It, it was crazy. By the way, the story comes from 104.3 Wow Country. Wow. Wow Country. I haven't broke that voice out in a while. I liked it. 104.3 Wow Country. I don't have a radio voice. So I'm a little jealous. We got some Garth Brooks coming up. We got Trisha Yearwood coming up on Wow Country. But first, a little bit of <laughs> Derek Dogman. This one's called <laughs> Fetch Me Bone. Nice. Yeah, on Wow Country. That sucked. <laughs> <Just so. laughs> All right, getting to the end of our, our show here today. By the way, uh, parachute stories. We need your parachute stories. Uh, we can get those by you emailing them, Tim at darknessradio.com. Uh, or. If you want to leave us a voice note, you can tell us. We, we want your lovely voice on the air. So you just send us your story. Send it by going to darknessradioshow.com. There's a blue button on the right-hand side of the website. You just click that and use your computer or your iPad or whatever you're using. And you can tell us your story on a voice note. You have two minutes to do so. If you need more time, click the blue button again. I will stitch those voice notes together. We'll play it right here on the show. Or if you have a handy-dandy nifty studio like this one, um, you can go ahead and put your theater of the mind together. Put in some sound effects, some music, uh, your own narration. I'll screen it, and we'll throw it here on the show. So there you go. Uh, our second to the last story today, Jess, involves a young boy who survived unscathed after he fell from a 16th floor window. How is that possible? I don't know. He's only four years old. Oh, poor honey. So he's got flexible bones. I know that. I guess. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The four-year-old who hails from France not only survived the fall, but somehow also avoided any serious injuries. Unbelievable. Yeah. The idea that anyone could survive unscathed after falling 43 meters from a high-rise window might sound ridiculous, but... This is exactly what happened in Aubervilliers, France, recently when a young boy plummeted from the 16th floor window of an apartment block on May 26th. According to reports, the boy who suffers from autism seemingly panicked after accidentally locking himself inside his own room. Aww. But poor little guy. When his father was finally able to break down the door, he was greeted with the or terrifying sight 
of an empty room and a window that was wide open. Oh, Looking, my God. Yeah. I, talk about terrifying. Absolutely chilling. Looking down from the balcony, he could see his son lying on the ground far below. Oh, my God. That, that is a nightmare. Yeah. Miraculously, however, by the time that he had gotten to the bottom floor, he found the boy not only very much alive, but seemingly none the worse for wear despite a huge fall. The kid was okay. That's crazy. His parents quickly took him to a local hospital where he was kept for observation, but apart from a small scratch on his leg and some other minor injuries, he seemed to be totally fine. That's a miracle. Isn't it? Within days, he was back to school as though nothing had happened. He had resumed a normal life. Everything is fine, said his mother. I was not a believer, but now I am. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah. And if that doesn't make you a believer, our last story today will make you believe. Oh, I can't wait. This story is a story of irony, Jess. Here is your ironic story of the day, folks. The Psychic News Magazine is battling to ward off closure. What does the Psychic News Magazine do? They debunk psychics. So they literally couldn't get advice from a psychic to tell them that they were about to be closed. (laughs) That is irony. How's that for irony? The editor of Psychic News has to admit that no, he did not see his own magazine's financial crisis coming. (laughs) True. (laughs) We didn't have to consult a clairvoyant to know that times were tough. What we didn't foresee coming was that the charity that funded us was going to withdraw its subsidy. Oh, ouch. Tony Ortson has spent much of his working life at the House Journal of British Spiritualism, which he joined as a junior reporter when it was a weekly newspaper in 1972. Now 72 years old, Ortson is still working six-day weeks with a skeleton staff while trying to save a publication that has been hit by the same issues that have plagued the rest of the news industry. Declining print circulation, soaring cost inflation, competition from the internet, and a slow recovery from the COVID lockdown. When people are hard up, they'll cut back on things like newspapers and magazines and going out for meals, he said. It's a combination of unfortunate circumstances. Spiritualism is, as Ortson put it, the belief that there is life after death and the so-called dead, and that they can make contact via a medium. It also promotes the highly disputed theory that people can be healed by spiritual healers transferring energy from the dead to the living. Ortson, who was trained by a reporter by the National Council for the Training of Journalists, said his magazine exists to promote this belief, but it took a professional approach towards journalism that was lacking in other online spiritualist outlets and influencers. Over the years, no one has been more forceful in exposing fake mediums and psychic news. I want to stress the majority of mediums are painfully honest people who will go to a spiritualist church and demonstrate on a soaking wet Friday night for 15 pounds and don't even get their petrol money. But as in all walks of life, there's the odd rogue and vagabond, he said. Ortson said the publication, which is now a monthly 64-page glossy magazine, reported without fear or favor on people who fake their ability to speak to the so-called dead. In the 80s, I was very impressed by a medium who was still alive, but who was exposed by the news of the world, he said. We reported their story straight down the middle. I still don't know whether the medium cheated or not. He suggested there was a problem with people failing to check the credentials of those claiming to be able to talk to those on the other side. The problem is anyone can say I'm a medium. Ortson declined to give exact circulation numbers for psychic news, saying his outlet was bumping along, but added that the magazine had been hit by the long-term decline in attendance at spiritualist churches in the UK. He politely bemoaned the way that people made, or rather that people shared a single copy with their neighbors and family, something that did not help sales figures. 
In an attempt to increase its readership, the magazine has branched into mind, body, and spirit in the broadest sense by pivoting to coverage of water dowsing and complementary medicine. The latest edition contains a feature on potential evidence for UFOs in the Vatican archives, alongside updates on the latest regulation of witches and a straight news report on a clinical scientist criticizing NHS hospitals that offer complementary therapies for cancer treatment. One of Ortson's favorite stories during his time on Psychic News was about a Brazilian medium called Luiz Antonio Gasparetto, who would go into a trance with his eyes closed and paint replicas of paintings by long-dead artists. Any famous artist you can think of had returned through him. He could start and finish a picture in minutes, one with his left hand and one with his right hand. He was living in a down-at-heel bedsit in Pimlico, London. And I had a private sitting with him, and he painted with his feet, Ortson said. Wow. Oh. That's pretty talented. Until recently, Psychic News received a subsidy from the spiritualist charity JV Trust to cover losses. But it was recently informed that this funding would be wound down over the coming months, leaving Ortson to resort to a GoFundMe appeal in an attempt to raise 30,000 pounds to keep the publication going as it approached the centenary of its founding in 1932. If we can struggle on for a further 18 months, we can hopefully become self-sufficient, Ortson said. He is assisted by Paul Brett, who holds the roles of assistant editor, assistant boss, or I'm sorry, assistant editor, advertising boss, circulation and marketing manager, along with a number of part-time staff, all are now at risk of redundancy. Orton uh, said he had no time for people who mocked his faith. If you're going to criticize something, you should have some experience with what you're trying to debunk. Spiritualists are quite normal people. Most of my neighbors know what I do, uh, they probably think I'm dotty, uh, but without sounding big-headed, I think when you pass, you'll find out. I have no doubt whatsoever that when they pass on, and this applies to believer and skeptic, they will find out the reality of life after death. I shall be very spiritual and won't say, I told you so. I will give them a big hug and say, how lovely to see you again. And that is what's going on with Psychic News. It's too bad. That's a bummer, but what a great attitude that guy has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully he finds the 30,000 pounds laying around somewhere and they can continue on. It'd be nice to see him go till 2032 and reach that 100 year anniversary, but. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. Things aren't looking. Maybe good. he can have that Nelly ghost rob some people for him and hook him up. Yeah, right? Yeah. Ghost and Nelly can rob people's pockets. Why not? Yeah. He just needs to get to the drum and monkey. That's right. Before it becomes it all a, goes back to the drum and monkey. That's right. Before it becomes a parking lot or an office building. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't it Joni Mitchell that said said that? Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. They uh they did something and put up a parking lot. What is it? They Yeah. Paved paradise and yes. put up a parking lot. There you go. They paved paradise yeah. and put up a parking lot. Thank I just sing it in my head for a minute. Yeah, I, I was too. I was trying to sing the lyrics. In my head. <laughs> so there you go. So that does it for today's supernatural news. Uh, Jess, you've got two trips that are now listed. Is the is the code still working? We definitely still have the code for you guys. Yeah, for that November event, I have the tickets up and ready for you to buy, and you can get twenty percent off with Darkness Twenty. There you go. Also, uh, if you go to uh, Jess's website, which is listed in the um, description of this program, there are two books for pre-sale that are available right now. Be sure you um, support Jess and go get those books for pre-sale. Um, when Jess has them fully released, we'll have her on the show to talk about those books because we want to. Uh, That'd be so fun. Yeah, we want to. We want to find out the scoop on those books. So there you go. Speaking of guests on this program, tomorrow on the big show, as we're taping this, Jess, I got six and one half dozen of the other. I've got a really good show on hand that we're ready to air with Dr. Bo Kirkwood. And it's about intelligent design in the universe. And I'm ready to spring this on you. But I have this other show potentially waiting for you. 
tomorrow. Mm. And I can't say what it is. Oh, fingers crossed you get it. Yeah. And we'll get the other one next week. Yeah. We'll still get it. So it could be Dr. Bo Kirkwood tomorrow, which is a good? really good show. It's a really good show on intelligent design. If you don't get him tomorrow, you'll get him uh, sooner than later. You'll get, If you don't get him this week, you'll get him next week. Um, but I did this show with Dr. Bo Kirkwood, taped the show with Dr. Bo Kirkwood, and very good show. Talking about why, and, and it's, a, it's a good show for believers and skeptics alike. Talking about how science proves intelligent design, that there's an intelligent designer behind the universe. In other words, there's a God that designed the universe. And you can still believe in science. And he, he proves in this book, through science, that the universe and the earth are created. And it's not evolution. Which I find fascinating. There, there's these topics that expand our brains. And I, that, for some reason, this month was a month I wanted to expand brains. When you're, you know, when you're sitting out on the beach and you're popping up, open a book or listening to a podcast, normally it's mindless stuff, right? You, you're not trying to think too hard. I don't know. Yeah. For, for some reason, I wanted to stimulate the brain a little bit and get you thinking. Thank you for making me smarter. There you go. Well, you're welcome. But it's just... One of those things where I wanted people to think, you know what, maybe I could put my chocolate and my peanut butter and my peanut butter and my chocolate. You know, maybe I could take my skepticism, throw it in my believer, my believer and my skepticism. So we're going to do that tomorrow, if it's tomorrow, because I might have another bullet in the chamber here, Jess. Come tomorrow. I'm still either waiting. Either way, it's going to be great. Yeah. So you're going to get a good show either way tomorrow on The Big Pro. So that'll do it for today. Thank you so much for continuing to listen to this program and supporting this program. Again, I'll remind you, darknessradioshow.com. Check out the shop. Check out Jess's website for those trips and for the books and continue to support this program. We love you. We appreciate you. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow for the best in paranormal programming. This is Darkness Radio.